Okay, uh, we're rolling. Okay. Um, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 20th of March, 2006. Um, approximately 11.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russell. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is uh, Arthur W. Roberts, and I was born in Utica, New York, and I was born on the 8th of April, 1926. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Prior to it, I had just graduated from high school. In fact, uh, I graduated in January of 1944 and went into the service. Uh, I volunteered, sounds great, but the only problem was that I would have had no choice at all the next day because I volunteered on, a on the 7th of April and then the next day, why, I was 18 when the draft would have taken me and I preferred to be uh, not in the trenches. <coughs> Okay, so you uh, you volunteered to go into the Navy. Why, why did you, besides not wanting to go into the trenches, was there any other reason why you picked the Navy? Well, I figured this way. If, if I got out there uh, on the ocean, I was going to have a clean bunk every night, and uh, if the ship disappeared, well, then it didn't really matter. So that's what I did. Okay. Um, when did you join the service, did you say? I joined on April 7th. 1944. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Where'd you go for your basic training? Yep. We went to Samson Naval Base, oh, okay. and, which later became a, a college and so forth, and I don't know, even know if there's anything there. Near Geneva. Mm -hmm. And how long was that training for? We had six weeks, and uh, during that time, why we mainly <laughs> ran and ran around what they called the grinder. There were these, uh, there was a big oval, I think it was a, oh, I'm not sure, it might have been a mile around it or whatever, but uh, each group uh, that you, uh, in there would have a grinder, and the groups were a number of companies and so forth. Um, but at any rate, all we did seemed like they were always after us uh, for whatever we had done, and we would run around the grinder. So. <laughs> I was happy that I was 18 years old, and not like some of the guys, because we had some fellows who were about 35 or so, mm -hmm. and uh, I can remember running with my arms out like this to just kind of help the guy in front of me. Today, I think I could make it from here to the sidewalk, and then I'd want to be carried. Was that your first time away from home? Yeah, it really was, other than uh, going to camp for two weeks or going, you know, something like that, mm -hmm. but that's all. Where did you go from Samson? From Samson, uh, I went uh, home for a beautiful uh, 10 days leave or whatever they give you. And this was just before, um, before uh, um, the invasion in Normandy. And uh, let me tell you a little something about that because it, it, it gives you an idea of what it was like. Um, I was home in my kitchen, my mother, a uh, wonderful woman, uh, had three sons, and the oldest one was a paratrooper in the 101st Airborne Division. And he, uh, he was 12 years older than I, than I, so he'd be about 30, and he was a captain in, in the 101st. And I remember being in the kitchen. Now, I was going to go back to camp on the 6th of, uh, of, um, of uh, June. And uh, as you know, the invasion took place that time. So this is like two or three days before that. And I was in the kitchen, and all of a sudden they brought, uh, over the radio came uh, a song that always, my mother always loved. It's So Danny Boy, you know, the London Derriere. And I'll never forget her being in there, and she never did said anything to indicate she was nervous or worried. She gave me her full attention. But all of a sudden, when they started singing that, bless her heart, she took her apron, brought it up to her eyes like this, and cried. And I'll never forget what she said. She says, oh, Huey, Huey, my boy, where are you? And he was, uh, he was within a couple of days of jumping in Normandy, because he jumped before 
uh, you know, before the invasion started, and mm -hmm. uh, and they uh, they took some territory and mm -hmm. so forth and mm -hmm. made it easier for the troops. But you were asking me about um, where you went from Samson. Yeah, you you went on leave. I work. went home, but then I went on leave. Yeah. I, and then after that, I came back and they sent me to Mass Radio Telegraph School, which is located in uh, in Boston, or it was at the time on Boylston Street. How long was that training? <clears throat> Excuse me. I uh, we went. I got there in in uh, June, and I stayed, as I recall, till October. And you came out with a third class radio man because I was a radio operator. Mm -hmm. And uh, learned <laughs> learned uh, the Morse code, and thank heavens they taught me how to type because I use it all the time. Did you learn uh, the semaphore uh, no. signaling? No, no, I just learned, uh, you know, da 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 I just sent news <laughs> and EWS, and, uh, but that's what we did. And I still have that. I can still do it. I, about a year or two ago, I got onto the shortwave and just listened, and I think I could do about ten words a minute. But when I was in the Navy, they had us up to uh, 40, mm -hmm. you know, and we just type away. In fact, I can remember being at sea one time, and we had some eggs cooking over here on, uh, on a little hot plate and so forth. And I was uh, in the radio shack typing away the Morse code, and all of a sudden I realized I wanted to flip those eggs. And this is how, it, not that I was terrific, it's just they had trained us. Mm -hmm. And so I, I remember thinking, uh, thank heaven, I turned up the gain so I could hear it, took the the earphones off, ran over, flipped the eggs, came back and caught up what they'd said. <laughs> so it was good. Um, but uh, we were there through the summer of 1944, and then we came out and got to, uh, and and came and, uh, and got our ships. And um, I was then given a leave, came home, and then a few days uh, later, uh, I was in San Francisco, California, where I was going to meet the, uh, be a part of the crew of the USS Oneida. And this is interesting, I think, uh, it was to me. The USS Oneida was, of course, named after Oneida County, right mm -hmm. here in our state. And uh, so, and, and all, everybody, all these fellows are getting bored, they're all talking about the Oneida. Oh, that's our ship's the Oneida, and of course I was able to tell them what it was. The fact of the matter is, the captain was uh, from Utica, and he was a retired four-striper Annapolis man, man. His name was Arthur Cooper Geisenhoff, and Geisenhoff, well, Geisenhoff was the one uh, uh, who took it and put it under command, you know, and took us out on a shakedown cruise and then took us out to sea. And uh, he was there until uh, about the time that I was finally got off the ship and came home. Uh, but Geisenhauer was, he was, he was good. He was good to me. And I kind of got, there's was a big difference between a third class radio man and the captain, but I, being a radio man, I had to take the, uh, take the uh, uh, messages into him. And of course, you had to get his signature. So I saw him very frequently. So. Now, what did you mean when you said he was a retired for a striper? Oh, I'm sorry. He was a captain. Okay. That would be, uh, what would it be, uh, um, brigadier think... general, maybe? Full okay. colonel. colonel. Full colonel. Exactly. He'd be like a full colonel. So anyway, um, he got me. Uh, he got me in there, and uh, I mean, I was there with him, and I remember that all of a sudden. I got a communication from home, and here was a picture of, uh, of uh, some people presenting a flag to the Oneida County Historical Museum. And it said, now we had at that time gone, sailed the ship on the shakedown cruise. We'd gone down to L.A. and we got down to San Diego, back up to Syracuse. I mean Syracuse, I'm thinking college. Uh, back up to uh, San Francisco. And when we got there, I got this communication, and here they were presenting the flag. But I always remember what Geisenhoff did. He sent the flag from the shakedown crews to the home, and then they quoted him, and he said, 
It is soiled and weather beaten, but its scars are honorable. And it was ripped. And the only thing I figure out is it probably got ripped when they were raising and lowering it uh, for stores or something. But, uh, but he was a good man, and, and uh, I showed him the clipping, and, then, and he just smiled. He said, well, he says, you know, the home folks like that kind of thing. <laughs> so that's what we did. Now, what kind of ship was the Oneida? Oh, that was a, it was the APA-221. Uh, they called it an attack transport. It mm -hmm. had about 500 crew, and it could take uh, 2,000 troops. We were an amphibious troop ship. We carried on those on our decks, the LCVPs, landing craft mm -hmm. vehicle personnel, and uh, that would go into the beaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what we did. And uh, I think I got across that Pacific Ocean. I, I really, I think at least 10 times. It just, we got sent on what I call the milk run. We'd go, we'd go up, we went out to, um, what, what is it, uh, the Hawaiian Islands, then we'd go to Enoetak in the Marshalls, then we'd go on to Ulithi in the Carolines, then back up to maybe Guam, and then back to Midway, and then they'd turn us around again. It was, it was that kind of a thing. That is until, uh, until the next year when we were... Uh, we were uh, uh, so can I ask you those ten trips? Then you were just t you were taking troops into the not always. Oh, okay. No, no. In all candor, when when we when this happened, we were uh, the war was pretty well over. I mean, if you look at it, uh, they'd had the Battle of the Coral Sea, and the Japanese didn't have much to throw against mm -hmm. us. Uh, it was pretty much an easy time. But from a, from that standpoint, we did get in to where there was some danger, and that was. At um, at uh, Okinawa, mm -hmm. and uh, as you may recall, that that uh, invasion was on Sunday, the first of April in 1945. So, and uh, I'll tell you an interesting thing about that, though. Uh, I think a lot of people may remember uh, hearing of the battleship that was uh, uh, bombed 50 miles off the coast of Japan when they're their suicide bombers came in and dove in, and they really hit it. And uh, uh, they had all kinds of explosions on it. The chaplain risked his life, Catholic chaplain, who got the men out, and uh, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor for what he did, and he survived. Mm -hmm. And the way it worked out, I was down in Ulithi, way south in the Carolyn Islands, and these... Um, and all of a sudden, we saw this ship coming by. Now, you must understand, all these APAs were lined up all the way to the border, one after the other. It was a huge, and we, were, we all knew we were going to go in two weeks to the, uh, in, in the invasion. When by us came this, um, this uh, big battle wagon, and, uh, uh, I'm, no, I'm sorry, it's not, it wasn't a battle wagon, it was an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. and, the, the uh, Franklin came by us, and we, we found out what it was. And then, out of nowhere, we got a communication that the USS Oneida had been chosen to take the troops back to uh, the States. And so, instead of going in and being uh, uh, in the danger, the good Lord saw fit to spare me, and we got, into, we got, uh, we got that crew aboard us. And we took them all the way back, uh, not to the United States. They, we got, because we had the milk run, we got back to Hawaii, and God darn it, they then took the troops off, put them on somewhere else, and, on another ship, and back we went to the milk run so that we were going. But we, it delayed us uh, uh, 30 days. And as you know, uh, Okinawa was pretty tough. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, uh, again, spared. I don't think of myself uh, as much of a hero, <laughs> but I put in my time. Were you off Okinawa? Did you see any of the kamikaze attacks while you were there at all? Or Yeah, I did. When we did get there, the kamikazes came out, and uh, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, but when we got uh, when we got there i was a radio man and as i said and i was the phone talker you've seen them with the big helmets and all of this mm -hmm. and they had me i was an 18 year old kid they had me up on the bridge 
and the, all the news came through here in my earphones and then I said what I was to say. So we had what we, we were in what's known as a flash red condition. Uh, flash red, uh, make smoke, everybody was under a smoke screen so that nothing, we wouldn't be visible, no one would get, they wouldn't have targets. And in the, in the middle of this thing, uh, I'm standing up there and everything is going along okay and all of a sudden Ed Turpy down in Radio 3 says to me, says to me, uh, I was called Bridge, he said, Bridge, uh, uh, Green Parrot from Picardy, flash white, secure smoke, secure from general quarters. So I just said it, I said, Green Parrot from Picardy, flash white, secure smoke, secure from general quarters. And about that time, Ed Torby says, Roberts, you know that's not us. You know that's Hagushi Bay, not Buckner Bay. That's over on the other side of the island. I said, oh, flash red, you know, general quarters and everything else. Well, they then go like this, you know, they had that, and they start putting us back. So, you know, and, but the thing was, everybody started to move. So what happened was, on a Navy ship, when you move, you have to go aft on the starboard and forward on the port. So you go back. So everybody, you couldn't run back 20 feet in the dark. You had to go around the whole thing. Mm. So that's what they did. <laughs> Meantime, there's no smoke with us. And over on, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the fantail was our smoker. And as it happened, they yelled, you know, we, we changed the order, and while the crew was getting back to the guns, we were suddenly visible, and they tried to start the generator, and, and uh, uh, the, the uh, equipment, it didn't work, they'd broken a fan belt. So now, the only thing we had was an LCVP with its own smoker, you always circled your ship with that. So they were going round with this, and uh, ultimately, why, uh, wouldn't you know it, all of a sudden we hear, uh, uh, and this is what we looked up and we saw that and we just looked and looked and looked and he started down and thank heaven I don't know what happened but he changed his mind and he went for a ship behind us so as a result we got through and that's why I I did I wasn't discharged from the service the captain came rushing up and he and what he said was he said and I'll tell you what he said because I remember he said who the hell gave that goddamn order? <laughs> and and I I my mother taught me to be honest. I said I did, sir. And he's he says you're just a goddamn and listen, man. He said where the hell's the O.D. Well, the O.D. didn't speak to me for a month. <laughs> but you see, if I'd been a little more alert, I would have been able to filter that out of there. So I you know I bear the more the responsibility. But thank heaven we didn't get killed. And uh, and that was the limit of my heroism in the war. What was your your equipment like on the ship? Uh, radio equipment. You had all the best. Oh yeah, you think? yeah. And and du during the war, what we copied was was uh, uh, code groups. All of this stuff was uh, was you know uh, what's the word coded and you would get five letter groups of miscellaneous numbers and and letters uh, which uh, they'd have a key for that changed every day and so consequently um, fellas like me had no idea what we were copying we just had to be able to take that and, and get it down uh, as far as the equipment was concerned yes it was it was very very good and what was interesting about it was that they had to tie it down in the storms because they'd have this big piece of equipment, uh, you know, uh, anchored to the floor, but they were heavy, some mm -hmm. of them. And uh, sometimes the ship would take a roll this far, back and forth, and, and uh, so that could be that could be kind of tough. Mm -hmm. So we would we would do that, but they did let us have eggs and bacon and things like that, so it wasn't too bad. And I, I, I think that's a lot better than having to go to a foxhole. Mm -hmm. so. so you think daily life was was pretty good then on, on the ship. It was very good except uh, when you'd been out for quite a while. Then they found that there was alien life that got into the flower and one thing and another and 
Uh, I have bitten through a few bugs, uh, figuring that what the heck, I was hungry and, and they were all cooked already, so, <laughs> so we did. But uh, the Navy was very good about giving us fresh fruit, and, and when, the minute we got into port, the, the country did well by us. I mean, it was there, and, and you got, uh, you got good, you know, just good eats once that happened. How were the officers on your ship? Uh, I think you, you spoke highly of, of your commander of the ship. How about others? Well, I thought so. I, I thought they were. I'll tell you, and you just made me think of something that's, that a lot of people wouldn't believe this, but uh, I was, uh, we had a Catholic chaplain there, and his name was uh, Father Joel. And I remember seeing one of the officers come out of uh, where he was, and uh, I was kind of close to Father Joel. We, we played cards together and a few other things, you know, it was good. And what he, uh, what he told me was, he said that the fella that this, I can't think of his name now, but the fella that came out of there, he said that he had been married to Lucille Ball. And, uh, which, you know, she later became, well, she was a big star then in 44. But they had divorced and, uh, and so on and so forth, and that uh, he was kind of broken up. And uh, uh, he told me that in confidence, but, and I, you know, I didn't tell anybody. But here, this is what, how many years later, I guess I can spill the beans. some years. <laughs> yeah. But he was, uh, but um, uh, we had some very, very good people aboard there. And I haven't, I haven't seen any of them since. Um, other than, uh, well, even the chaplain I didn't see later, so it's about all I can tell you about them. Uh, well, there was Ensign Good. I just have a thing. Ensign Good was, was uh, I think of him as being a handsome, uh, capable, very uh, astute, um, you know, Beto Bailey, what's the name of the little, <laughs> what's the name of the, of the colonel, I mean the uh, lieutenant there? The one that's Fuzz. always doing reports, Lieutenant Fuzz. Lieutenant Fuzz. Well, this guy, this guy was not, was was not uh, a Lieutenant Fuzz. He was quite bright and capable, mm -hmm. but he was a stickler for things. And one of the things he would not put up with was anybody being late. And I'm a, I was a notorious late sleeper, so I found myself got report every now and then from from Ensign Good, uh, and. Uh, but they finally told him, says, you can't do that to this guy because uh, uh, we don't have, uh, I mean, we're out at sea, we need this. You can't be putting him in the brig. So I managed, managed to get away a little bit anyway. What do you think was the one impression, if you had one Im thing that you recall that left the biggest impression on you, what was it? You mean in the, in the whole time? Yeah. Oh, boy. Hmm. That's a hard one. There were there were a lot of different things that mm -hmm. happened. Well, more than one then, if you have others that. Well, um, I think I think uh, of course I mentioned the fact that I almost sank my own ship. Mm -hmm. One one of the things just pops in my mind was was interesting. We were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and uh, and out from nowhere. Uh, uh, there was we we found a mine. Now what a mine was doing out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, I don't know. But they had seen it, and it was a live one. And so we were all alone in the Pacific, and they just put us. Uh, they just came up and got a safe distance away, and then uh, we were at general quarters because if it hit us, it would have you know been horrible. Uh, but while, uh, while one of our, our fellows had a rifle and started shooting at those little protrusions that come mm -hmm. out, and uh, it took him quite a few shots, and he took a little ribbing about, you know, missing the target, but eventually it went. And I, what I remember about that was the fact that it was today what we know as a mushroom cloud. The thing went, there was this big explosion, and all of a sudden up funneled, you know, the water, and then spread out like a big toadstool, and then gradually went down. So, uh, so I guess I guess that's one of the things that uh, that I would find difficult to, you know, to forget. Did you get to see any uh, USO shows, or get to spend much time ashore? Yeah. Well, I, we didn't get much time ashore. We mm -hmm. got three. We got three days. Uh, uh, 
I mean, um, we got like uh, five hours Liberty. on a beach in, well, Anahuitac. I mean, what are you going to do there? You drink a little of that 3.2 beer and so forth. But um, one of the things that, that comes to mind from that is the fact that I had, uh, I would, it's amazing, I just ran into more people that, that, that I knew from home. I, I, it's almost unbelievable. Um, a football star at UFA when I was there was Walt Sheridan. He later became uh, uh, investigator for the uh, Kefauver Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, uh, Walt uh, was even rumored as be uh, uh, possibly becoming the, uh, uh, getting Hoover's job when Hoover retired. Uh, but at that time, I knew Walt, and I'd been walking out, uh, walking in, out of a place in, Sar in, uh, in San Francisco, and there he was. And uh, he was just one of many, and he took me aboard his submarine and showed it to me. Uh, but that's one example. I could, I could probably tell you about 10 or 12 different ones that, you know, all of a sudden they're there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, of, one of the fellas that was another football star from Proctor High School, which is a rival high school, and was a friend of my brother's, he was, on, he was at Anahuitac playing baseball. And, uh, uh, and there he was. So... I had this kind of a thing, and very, very frequently ran into people that I knew. What USO shows did you see? The one that I saw was at the Hollywood Canteen. And my brother, I have a brother, or I had a brother, bless his heart, my brother Wally, and uh, he met me in San Francisco. He was in the Air Force, or the Army Air Corps in those days, and he he met me and we went to uh, to the there and uh, Roddy McDowell was uh, then about 14 years old. You may recall mm -hmm. him from being in in the movies. And I was thinking of uh, how green was my valley. He had a beautiful part in that. So anyway, he was there and he recited and did a few things. But as far as U.S. U.S.O.s, we didn't get to those very much. That was. Um, that was uh, something that was uh, you'd have to be ashore for, and we, we never got ashore. When you made most of these uh, cruises out to the Pacific and back, uh, what were the things you carried? Did troops and supplies, or well, we did carry. We did <coughs> carry. Uh, we carried stores, and we carried mm -hmm. uh, uh, troops. One of the one of the groups that we carried. This is interesting. Was. Uh, was the war was over, just about, and our ship took a number of uh, of uh, Japanese prisoners uh, from uh, Okinawa to uh, Iwo Jima, and uh, so we had them on there. Well, they they were, I mean, I have no, I don't know the language or anything else, but our suspicion or, or our understanding was that a number of some of these people were were. Um, were uh, Okinawan c uh, civilians, um, but I what I remember was uh, a really dramatic moment was when there was a kid on there. I I think he must have been like 12 or 13 years old. Maybe they put a gun in his hand or something else. But he was aboard it, and he he had not didn't have the language, but he was just so likable, and and uh, he was very smiling and trying so hard, and he was just a kid. And all of a sudden, there was a mix-up on deck, and the kid ran. And, of course, there's a guard there with a rifle. And I remember I saw this. He said, he said, halt. He said, halt. Then he goes like this with his rifle. And then he says, oh, for crying out loud. And he gave somebody the gun, and he ran after the kid, said, get back there, God darn it. And, you know, but for a moment there, I was really... Those are the things you don't forget, mm -hmm. but um, but it worked out. He, the kid got back, and I suppose probably he's an old grandfather today, <laughs> like me. Um, when were you? Dis or no, I might ask you. Um, do you remember where you were when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? And and if you had a reaction to it. Uh, I'm just trying to think where we were at that time. I think we were off Okinawa. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure uh, we were up in there. We were there when they, uh, that's where we were when 
the armistice was, I mean, you know, when, mm -hmm. the, the, when the war ended mm -hmm. in the ceremonies, we weren't pretty close up there. Um, I don't really, you know, I, I don't have any vivid mm -hmm. recollection of uh, Roosevelt's dying, except that I, like so many people, felt it was a horrible thing to lose him. Mm -hmm. What I do remember was being a kid in high school when, when that war started, mm -hmm. and uh, I was 15 years old, and they had us the next day in an assembly at the place, and we listened. And we heard uh, him say, a day which will live in infamy. Mm -hmm. And I always remember that when he said that, he said, and so I asked that the United States of America and the Congress, or whatever it was, declare that a war has existed between the United States and the Empire of Japan. Well, I remember as a kid saying to myself, what does he mean, has existed? It's on now! It, 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 you know, so I was a little upset by the way he said it, but of course he was correct and I wasn't. Um, How did you hear about the, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor? I was walking, I was walking uh, along South Street in Utica, and as, as I recall, it was in the afternoon, it seems to me that we, that it wasn't wasn't a terribly cold day, but I was with a fella a fella that I that a, a dear friend Lou Scalzo, and uh, he was maybe a year or two younger than I am, and uh, and we we were going by uh, an open spot and and somebody had a radio on and we heard it, and then we went right back up to his house and sat and and you know mm -hmm. and we did it. Um, so that was uh, that was just um, you know a devastating day because, mm -hmm. and of course that turned the whole country around. There were a lot of people that were isolationists, but it all ended there. When were you discharged? On May 26, 1946, I was uh, I was discharged at Lido Beach, Long Island. Mm -hmm. And I rode the troop train um, back from San Francisco and got back into into town and uh, into U Utica. Oh, you know, a week later or so. It was uh, quite a thing for all of us. Uh, I, I can tell you, um, the idea that you could go back and have a life again, because boy, there's no change quite so great as as uh, being a kid in high school and then suddenly being, you know, in uniform, restricted, mm -hmm. unable to do, and so forth. It was tough. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Full use. It was one of the most wonderful things that ever happened. I got, um, I got back and they had a thing called the 5220 Club. Yep, I was going to ask you that. Did and, you use that? Uh, the 5220 Club, we went right on and that got me through for a few weeks, then I got a job on the railroad as uh, on a, as a section hand um, with a lot of other vets, uh, you know, and that's where you where you do the heavy work and you swing the picks and all that. And then that fall, I went to Syracuse mm -hmm. and uh, majored in psychology for want of something uh, uh, else, really. I and uh, ended up. Uh, Oddly enough, being an English teacher, so. Okay. So that uh, you did that after you service your service, then English teacher. Right. Okay. Well, a lot later. I didn't get to yeah. be that until I was uh, much older. Mm -hmm. I, I was a salesman for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you uh, ever join any veterans organizations? I have to tell you the truth. That's I almost, <laughs> I almost joined. When I got out of the service, I'd be honest with you, I love my country, but I really didn't want, I'm not a warrior. So when, when I went to college and when I came out, a bunch of my friends said, hey, you ought to go over and join the Naval Reserve. You're a code man, you'll get so you can talk to people all over the state. You'll have a wonderful time. So I determined to do it. 
So I went, I went, and well, let's just say that it was like a Tuesday, and we went over to do it, and the fellow said, I'm sorry, he said, but the captain's away until Friday. Could you come back Friday, and you can get sworn in, and we'll show you just how to do it. And uh, so I said, fine. And then it was, I, I'm just guessing now, but I think it was the 25th of June, was it? Uh, that uh, that the Korean War oh, started, yeah, there. and I said to myself, I don't think I'm going to join the reserve, <laughs> so I never went back. Hmm. Okay, um, you didn't join any veterans organizations then? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. okay. I didn't. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that served with you? Well, of course. Uh, you're talking about people right in there. Um, not really that much. Um, I did. I did go out to. Uh, was going out to California with the same loose scales on another fella, and we were riding in a car and we came through Oklahoma. And I got on the phone and called up a fella named Motier Alvin Thurlow the Fifth, and he was a big husky kid that he was 75 miles away where he lived, and. Uh, we all called him Motier, but he was the most amiable, sweet, wonderful kid you'd ever see. And he was built like a horse, but he was a gentleman, uh, unless provoked, of course. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember, I remember there, uh, I remember one time Motier was with a guy who was pretty drunk, and the guy was, uh, was one of the, you know, storekeepers or something, uh, a boatswain's mate. And uh, he came up to, uh, to Motier, and he, he was mad, trying to pick a fight. He even pounded him one, and Motier says, oh, you're just this and that. And then all of a sudden, the guy said, your mother is a so-and-so. And Motier went, boom! <laughs> and I said, I said to him, I said, uh, Motier, what got you? You really got mad, didn't the other body? And he says, no, nah. he said, but he can't talk about mom like that. And that was it. But he was one of the very few that I did see. I, I've often thought, and kind of regretted that I didn't get back and, and, and see a few. And, and uh, every now and then you think of some of the old guys or you see an old picture, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I just went on to other things and, and just didn't. Could you, uh, I know this is a copy of the photograph, if you held this up, could you tell us where and when that was taken? Yeah, this was taken when I was in mass radio and telegraph school, and um, they had a they had a, um, an offer from this photography studio saying free picture for all servicemen, and uh, so I thought, well, I like that that kind of uh, uh, charges. So I walked in and and they took the picture, mm -hmm. and uh, okay, um, how about this one? Well, this one, I'm sorry you can't see it better, but this one is one with my beloved older sister, Betty, and my little, uh, her daughter, my niece, Mary Lou. Mary Lou was eight in this picture. Betty was, uh, uh, and she had come down to greet me as I came home. So this is an actual moment when I walked through the doorway at, U at uh, Union Station in Utica, and was home at last, and we went from there right up to the house and where everybody was and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's that's a while. Did uh, both your brothers survive the war? They both did. Uh, my oldest brother uh, uh, was in a good bit of action with the uh, with the uh, the hundred and first. My other brother was Mr. Happy Go Lucky and. He went, they both, it's interesting, both of them went into the service in, uh, I think it was, it was uh, January or February of 1940. You know, they had the draft and the rest. And so they both left separately. And uh, Hugh uh, ended up in the 101st, but my brother Wally, Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky, managed to go from the Army into the Air, Army Air Corps. He went through every aerial gunnery school they had and I don't know what else, and, and he mechanic school, and then he got into cadets, and he went to, uh, to uh, uh, Pullman, Washington. He was 
uh, <laughs> he was uh, in school and so forth, and then he was the uh, leading person, or whatever you call him, uh, general or whatever, you know, a student general, mm -hmm. on the field and all the rest of it. And uh, when it came time for me, the 15-year-old when he left, or 14-year-old when he left, when it came time for me to be going overseas, I was able to get in touch with him, and he managed to cop himself a flight, and he came in uh, from where he was in Arizona in to see me. And so here he is, he's now got officers, what, I don't know, with the blue and the gold or whatever it is that they have, and he was a low-rank officer now, and uh, he came aboard ship, and, and, uh, and as he was getting ready to leave, I always remember, I said to him, I said to him, Wally, how come I'm going overseas? I said, I was 15 when you went in. He said, he said, I, I mean, I, I said, how come you're, I'm going and you're still here? And he says, never mind, kid. He says, give him hell. <laughs> and uh, because he was Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky. So, so that's what happened with him. He, um, he, was, uh, he was quite a guy, and uh, I was awful sorry to lose them both. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Okay.